It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio, flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. And good morning to everyone. It is a a snowy day in the neighborhood, and I think it is for you too, Peggy. Yep. Um, Yep. In fact, if uh, you're anywhere in the Midwest, um, there's, I think there's, well, not everywhere, but a lot of places in the Midwest are getting some snow this morning. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will be discussing that later on with meteorologist Rick DeMaio, but um, boy, oh boy, have we got a great show today? I am so excited <laughs> about this. Uh, the great yeah. Doug Tallamy is with us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about his work. We're going to be talking about his books, about his latest book, uh, Product Placement, The Nature of Oaks, uh, The Rich Ecology of Our Most Essential Native Trees. Uh, but then the uh, show is going to take a turn, and the part of the reason I've got Doug on the show today is, uh, and I hope you don't mind that I call him Doug. His name is Doug Douglas W. Tallamy, and of course he's a uh, a professor, uh, Doctor uh, Tallamy. Yes, in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, uh, but he goes by Doug, which uh, I'm grateful for, and. Um, <laughs> We're going to bring in Carrie Lee from the Natural Land Institute uh, in uh, Illinois uh, and talk a little bit about the ongoing situation at Bell Bull Prairie, which, uh, as most of you who watch this show regularly know, is in danger of being obliterated, perhaps as early as March 1st. Uh, And we've been talking about that fight to save this remnant prairie. It's dry gravel prairie five acres of, of high quality. There's 25 acres in all. Um, and it's a fight. It's a dog fight right now. Uh, and whether the, uh, the prairie will remain, uh, whether it will be here uh, two months from now, is up in the air. No idea. So uh, Up to the courts, the politicians. Uh, yeah. And, and who knows? Because uh, it is in the courts right now. Uh, and then, um, you know, because that's that's some sad news uh, in the 10 o'clock hour, we're going to have a good news story about a prairie. And sometimes you don't get those. A success story. A yes. success story. Uh, Deborah Behrens, the executive director of the Prairie Enthusiasts, will be with us uh, to talk about the, their grant. They just got a grant to save 350 acres of prairie. Actually, it's a farm that has some mm-hmm. remnant prairie on it. Um, in Up Wisconsin. in Wisconsin. Yep. Yeah. And um, uh, we'll talk to her uh, about that. And uh, and so I want to have some good news in here, too. It's very important to have yeah. some good news. And and just before we get to uh, Doug Tallamy, uh, I want to thank all the folks uh, who are watching who might be new to the show. We just got a bunch of new subscriptions to um our youtube channel and here's how yeah i'll I'll give a ding for the maybe there we go um 
<laughs> yeah, ding as much as you like. <laughs> <laughs> no, Excuse I'll ding me. even more when it gets a little higher. Yeah. Well, right now, I guess I should go. And by the way, I don't know. Are you are you on the chat function? Uh, because um, I yes. can't, I cannot get on it at all. And they yes. they redid uh, restream. Just did the redid their um, homepage. Uh, oh, everything I got the same. Let's see. Skeet says good morning and says oak trees. Yeah, Dan I know. Says, right. If Skeet's here, we're and we're talking oak trees. He's a happy guy. Um, Dan Costa's happy that Mother Nature's put down mulch this morning, so he's it, out there. Amos, that's, that's the way. That's the way I feel about it, and I can't see any of this. It's very frustrating. I'll have to reboot my computer Ooh, probably, and, and so they can it, talk about you when you can't see it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Go for it, folks. Um, but as of this morning. We had added 78 new subscribers to the page. Now, here's what happened. My birthday was Friday, and uh, yeah. you, as well, you know, 78 new subscribers. But yeah, it, well, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Birthday, yeah, but there's exactly. a bigger. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is. Um, uh, on, it, my birthday was Friday, and uh, as you know, on Facebook, people uh, often have a cause that they want people to donate to, and I th decided, you know. Bell Bull Prairie needs money for the legal fund to defend it in court. And uh, so I decided, you know what? I also need subscribers to my channel. So, you know, it's a twofer here. And, mm -hmm. I, and I told folks that if uh, they subscribed to my channel, I would donate $5 to the fund for each subscription. And we've had 78 so far. So we're up at like, Okay, what was the figure I had here? Survey says three ninety. It's three hundred ninety dollars so far going to the legal fund. I have the resources because some folks have generously stepped up to help. Uh, I have the funds to go to six hundred. If we blow past that, I'm going to find the money, well, and we'll uh, find more. We'll find more, uh, and I want to thank everyone who has done that. Um, and, uh, we're keeping the tally every day. I, I put something new, uh, on my Facebook page and, uh, uh, we'll just keep going. And so keep subscribing and then we'll keep uh, giving yep. five bucks to, uh, to the, uh, the fund. So, uh, so yeah, just go to the Mike Novak show on YouTube. Click uh, that little button. That says subscribe. Right. Just click the little button that says subscribe. You have to have a Google account. Uh, which we discovered the other day with some relatives who said, I can't get on. Well, do you have a Google account? And uh, I thought everybody yeah. in the world had a Google account, but apparently and not if everybody. if you're doing it off your phone, you do need to log in. Otherwise, yeah. you can't click subscribe. All right. So that said, let us uh, go to uh, the guest. Should, should I do my little lead in here of what yes. I found oh, on the Yes, oh, yes, yes, Peggy, do, do your little lead in here. Yes, there we go. It, it, and it, look what else I just found that he will talk about. Wait. Uh, how is that different from the other one? Big Leaf. Oh, Big Leaf, Little, Little Leaf. Leaf. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is like, the one from this morning. This was in a book being pressed, but I knew where the book was. So. Got it. And and there he is, Doug Tallamy. Uh, Doug, thank you so much for being on our show uh, this morning. You're you're always so gracious with your time with us. I rem We talked to you first in uh, 2008, shortly after this book came out, Bringing Nature Home, How Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens. And if I've told many people, and, I, and by the way, I steal a lot of your material for garden talks that I do. So I apologize for that, if that's a problem. Uh, you don't steal, that's why I write it, so that you use it. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, and that book changed my life. It changed, and, and when I say that, it, I mean, it changed the way I look at the world and nature. Uh, and then you continued that theme uh, in Nature's Best Hope, um, a, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. And finally, the, the uh, I don't have the Richard Dark book here with me. You wrote one with him about designing gardens, but here's the latest, The Nature of Oaks, the Rich Ecology of Our Most Essential Native Trees. Uh, and Yeah, I can't get the camera right today. There we go. Oh, there we are. There's a theme that runs through all of these, and is that we've lost touch. We've lost touch with, with the nature around us, and in the words of the song, we've got to get back to the garden. Um, mm -hmm. When did that first... Uh, occur to you, 
I know you're an entomologist and you've studied this for years. At some point, there must have been a light bulb that went off and said, we're going down the wrong path. Well, you know, I was, I was born loving nature. Don't take any credit for it. I just was born that way. Uh, and I remember in third grade, we moved to a new area and there was a, a little pond right next to our house. Uh, and they were building houses all around us. But I used to go to the pond and watch the, the pollywogs and the toads. And I was there the day that the bulldozer buried that pond. And that was probably the first light bulb that went off. I said, you know, there's too many people. and We are destroying the nature around us. Uh, but a lot of light bulbs have gone off since then. It's been a gradual process. Um, you know, I, th I was thinking the other day, if a if an alien from another planet came to Earth and, and just looked around, he'd look at us and say, well, here's a species that's destroying its the quality of its air, destroying the quality of its water, destroying the life support systems that keep it alive. This is not a very intelligent species. <laughs> uh, you know, could we argue otherwise at this point? So, uh, I'm, you know, <laughs> we actually are intelligent. We just have to think a little bit further down, down the road and, and uh -huh. realize that we're part of nature. We are products of nature. We're totally dependent on nature. And to destroy it is not a good idea. So how do we put it back together? It's, it's everybody's responsibility. That's what nature's best hope is about. It, you know, you are nature's best hope. Uh, because we can turn this around. It's not that hard. But we all have to do it. All right. One of the things. Well, oh, it, yes, uh, Peggy. Something that I just when I, right when I started reading the book, following along with that, third page of the prologue, you know, um, this too many homeowners cut down the oaks on their properties because they've grown tired of raking leaves. The cause of this indifference is lack of knowledge. How can we be interested in or understand the ecological significance of something we know nothing about? You know, you so, know and, and right, as there. I, at, right there, and he echoes that or actually preceded that with the introduction in Nature's Best Hope when you write, Today, most people live in what I call the great suburban urban matrix, and we hardly interact with the natural world. Unfortunately, our ignorance of nature has led to a dangerous indifference about its fate. The local disappearance of once common plants and animals does not bother us because we have grown up with no knowledge of these species, and we cannot imagine why they are important to us. We do not teach our children that plants and animals actually generate the life support systems we all require. Plants produce our oxygen, clean our water, and delay its journey to the salty sea. They store atmospheric carbon that would otherwise wreak even more havoc with our climate. Plants build our topsoil and hold it in place, and they prevent floods when we leave enough of them in our landscapes. Animals, in turn, provide pest control services and pollinate not just our crops, but nearly 90 percent of all plant species we are living off the ecolog ecological interest that was generated by a healthy ecological bank account long ago but we are eating up the principle of that account at a steady and alarming rate um i do tend to repeat myself <laughs> and, and and i think in a good it's, way but it's necessary as you know, you've got to say it three or four or five or 150 times before it actually penetrates. Well, there's still a whole lot of people that never have heard it even once. So yeah. that's one of the reasons I do repeat myself. Almost every audience I ever have, they're people, you know, they're, it's just new. So yeah. say it again. Well, you Or know, it had no relevance in the past and now it finally does. Yeah. yeah. But you're talking to a guy here who, like you, I can remember the neighborhoods where I grew up in, in the 50s and going to the pond. And I love the fact you call them pollywogs and not tadpoles because that's what we call them, pollywogs. <laughs> um, and we would find pollywogs and, and look at that they're going to be frogs. Mm -hmm. um, and then the same thing happened. It all got bulldozed. It got all turned into um, a business Suburban park. Suburban sprawl. Yeah. Um, and my parents uh, were not campers. They were not nature people. Once a year, they would rent a cottage on a lake somewhere in Michigan because we grew up in Michigan. And that was my uh, brush with nature, going to the, uh, a cottage, staying for a week, and then coming home. And, and most of the time, you know, yeah, we'd, we'd go run around 
uh, it, wherever the lake was and wade in the water. But there wasn't a whole lot that I learned, that I gleaned about nature. So I'm, I'm your audience. I'm the guy you need to preach to. Um, except that I, I changed somewhere along the way. I, you know, there, a light clicked on with me. Um, and now I get it. But as you say, we need more people who get it. So, I'm working on it. <laughs> well, I, I hope so. Well, let's talk a little bit about, about I don't want to get into uh, just uh, stay in the negative here because you are a hopeful man. Uh, that's what amazes me about you. You believe we can fix this problem. Um, and one of the ways we fix it is uh, with oaks. Um, that's why you've written a book. I mean, you uh, talk about oaks a lot in your previous books because of their importance. Why are oaks important? Because they're supporting more life than other species. You know, I talk about how plant choice matters. We've got to choose the plants. If we're trying to rebuild ecosystems, rebuild food webs, we've got to use the plants that do that. And not all plants do. Yes, native plants do it better than non-native plants, but even among our native plants, there are huge differences. There are many species that contribute a little bit, but not all that much. But then we have a few species, we call them keystone species, that are, are making the bulk of the food that, that, that supports the rest of the ecosystem. And by making the food, I mean, remember, plants are, are capturing energy from the sun and turning it into food. But if they don't pass it on to an animal, then you don't have the animal. So oaks are passing on more food to animals than any other plant genus in, in the country. That's oh. why I focus on this. So great plants, you know, they're sequestering carbon, they're managing the watershed, they're, they're doing lots of important things. But I focus on that food web value. And, and you talk about the idea, uh, and I don't think uh, everybody understands, is that the, basically plants are the only um, life form that can take energy from the sun and, and create nutrients from it. And then the insects get it from the plants, and then the birds and the mammals uh, and the reptiles and all the other animals get it from the insects. And it goes all the way up that chain, or all the way down that chain, if we begin to lose that mass if we lose the plant biomass, which is the say the native plants, and the um, uh, then the insect biomass, which we are in the process of losing on this planet, um, it depends on the study you look at. But um, far too many uh, insects are disappearing across the globe. Um, the estimates are forty-five percent of our insects are already gone. I heard an estimate yesterday of 90%. That's too scary to think wow. about. So we'll just, yeah. be, we'll just say 45 or 50%. Okay. So you are the, the world, remember, so we can't afford to lose them. I, sorry, I'm sorry. What, Doug? Say that again, Doug. Insects are the little things that run the world, according to E.O. Wilson. E.O. Wilson. Of he's over. Yeah. Uh, right. Because of their power and in food web value and decomposing value they they truly are running our our terrestrial ecosystems all right well you emphasize the need for us to plant natives this takes me to a question that bothers me a lot because we talk gardening on this show a lot we talk about the environment uh, a lot uh, and trying to reconcile the two when i see a gardening book with pretty pictures and i look and i see that those pretty pictures are not natives, but other plants that have been brought in. Um, it, I cringe a little bit, knowing what I know and having read your books and, and believing in your philosophy. I, I, I've, <laughs> I bought it hook, line, and sinker. Um, so you point out in your books that there needs to be a certain percentage of native plants in a garden for us to create a sustainable world. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, there's one study that suggests it, and that actually was was uh, my PhD student Desiree Narango, who worked with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington D.C., and she found out that if you exceed 30% of the woody plant biomass in your yard as being non-native, so in other words, if non-natives start to dominate the landscape, then chickadee populations are unsustainable. They decrease every year and then eventually disappear. Uh, that's the only study that's been done, and people are, are, you know, citing it as if it's gospel. We need to do a lot more work in that regard. 
but it does suggest there's room for compromise. You can have your ginkgo, you can have your boxwood, you can have your forsythia, because they're not invasive species, they're not spreading, as long as they don't dominate the landscape. We should have at least 70% of our, our, our plant biomass. By biomass, I mean we're not counting individuals, we're seeing how, how much leaf material they're creating. If 70% is, is native, chances are real good you're gonna be able to support viable food webs. Well, there's, that's a, that's a good number. As you say, not enough work has been done, not, not enough study, and that's part of our problem. We haven't studied this issue, but we still have folks out there who, who contend that, you know what, it's a global economy, uh, we connect all over the planet, it's inevitable, We're, uh, plants, we've been shipping plants over here for, dec for, for centuries, you know, moving plants around the globe for centuries, get used to it, it it's, it's, uh, it, it's going to happen. What is wrong with that argument? And if we talk about inevitable things, we don't want to put our own extinction in there and say, well, that's inevitable. And the way we're headed now, that's inevitable right now. What's wrong with that is that our local insects, which again are fueling the food web, cannot eat those plants. So when you, you spread them all over the place, and then if they escape and become invasive species, and what is it, 86% of our woody invasive plants in North America are escapees from our garden. Just think of your, your buckthorn and, and your bush honeysuckle and all the other things. You've destroyed the food webs in, in natural areas as well. You know, we've, we've lost 3 billion breeding birds in North America in the last 50 years. There's a lot of causes for that, but taking away the food that, that supports them, particularly their reproduction, is one of those important reasons. And it's changing the plant communities by moving things all over the world that is, that is helping to do that. You uh, also, um, in a, a spot in the book, talk about the vicious cycle of, well, there's, there's a, a, let, me, let me back up just for a second and say that one of the things I try to do when I talk to audiences is tell them that insects are good. Okay, get over your fears. Um, and, and arachnids as well. I say spiders are the good guys generally. Um, and um, if, if you're one of those people who go, ooh, an insect, and your first response is to step on it, uh, you need to look in the mirror and, and change that attitude. Um, and you describe in the book this uh, vicious cycle of spraying in a yard to kill caterpillars. Um, and why anybody would kill cal caterpillars, I don't know. But if they're descending upon you, as you describe in the book, uh, <laughs> on, on silken threads or uh, of some sort, or threads of some sort, and, and you're going, oh, I've got caterpillars in my hair. Yeah, you're thinking you need to uh, get rid of them somehow. Can, can, can you talk about that a little bit? I thought that was a pretty uh, interesting um, story that you tell in the book. Yeah, you're referring to uh, actually my father. We used to, we did do a lot of camping when we were young. And in June, we'd put up the tents. And back then, there were a lot of what we called inchworms, geometric caterpillars. And in June, that first generation was through growing, and they'd be parachuting out of the out of the trees mm -hmm. so they could pupate in the ground. And they'd go. Sometimes they'd get down the back of his shirt or hit him in the head, and you know, oh, get them out of here. That was in a place where there were a lot of big oaks. It was before the gypsy moth came through and killed a lot of those, those oaks. Uh, and I can tell you that, that the, the reign of caterpillars at that part in, in uh, North Jersey no longer happens. And that's a huge, huge loss. Um, our trees are, are adapted to being able to support these caterpillars. Yes, there's a little bit of damage on the leaves, on each leaf. But they're, they're, again, they're passing on their food. And again, oaks are the best at doing that so that the birds have something to eat. It takes thousands and thousands of caterpillars to make one nest of bird. It takes thousands and thousands of caterpillars to, to support the migrating birds that are flying right past us and going up into Canada to reproduce. Did I say birds? Caterpillars. <laughs> um, so when we, when we reduce the, the number of caterpillars that are out there, we're really devastating the, the food web, both of our breeding birds and our migrating birds and all the other things that eat caterpillars that we don't even talk about. And, and that's the year-round food web, as you discuss in the book, too, that those caterpillars are there in the winter. 
Yeah, that, that was a big surprise. Bern Heinrich uh, figured that out. The uh, golden crown kinglet, this tiny little bird, and uh, it should migrate with all the other insectivores because that's all it eats is, is insects and spiders. But it doesn't migrate. It stays around in the wintertime. And, and, you know, he's scratching his head in Maine. What are these birds doing here? They're up in the trees flitting around. But well, we all know there's nothing in the trees to eat in the wintertime. Except we were wrong. Burn, burn looked at the crops of these golden crown kinglets and they were full of caterpillars. So he said, you know, there's caterpillars up there. And it's true. Again, it's most, mostly those, those inchworms, those geometrids that look just like sticks. They sit there all winter long. Uh, occasionally I'll find one in, in the wintertime. It's just sitting there, uh, not eating. And you wonder what it's doing there. It's probably there so that when the leaves bud out in the spring, it's the first, it's the first guy. It's, it's ready to go. It's already uh, almost a mature caterpillar. It's got to make it through the winter though, because the, the kinglets and the chickadees and the tip mice and many other small birds are combing those, those branches all winter long, looking for those, those insects. And you can watch them. Look out your window. Yeah, the, the, the chickadees and tip mice are at your feeder 50% of the time, but the other 50% of the time, they're all over those trees finding those, those insects. So yes, these trees are really important in terms of supporting the insects, even in the wintertime. Um, I, I, one of the things uh, I really appreciate is the way you transformed your, your acreage uh, from when you first bought it and uh, it was mowed for hay and there were basically invasive species on there with not much else. And, and you now have, what, a 20-year-old oak? white oak uh, uh, on the land. So you get to observe these things firsthand. Um, let's talk just a little bit uh, about oaks. Uh, we have a couple minutes and we're gonna, then we're gonna start getting into prairies in specific uh, with Carrie Lee. Um, you, have, you debunk a lot of myths about oaks, that they're too expensive, they're too slow growing, they're too big for small yards, the roots are damaging to, to sidewalk. Um, yeah, and uh, if you talk to Connor Shaw at Possibility Place Nursery here in Moni, uh, he'll sell you. He said, if you buy my oak, you're, you're not going to complain about how slow it grows, all right? It, it, it's, but people want these large caliper trees. They want the tree already. They want to put it yeah. in the ground, and the, most of the roots have been cut off to do that. So you're better off planting the acorn, as you say. Uh, in in your book, or or get or get your plant at Possibility Place from Connor Shaw, um, but uh, talk about those those myths uh, a, a little bit and and how um, we get around that with folks. You know, myths typically have some basis in in fact. Uh, so, can oaks be too expensive? Sure, if you buy a, a four inch caliber oak, you can spend three thousand dollars on it. But as you said, Mike, in order to get that, you either have a very small root system, one that's been grown in an in a air pot, or it's root bound, or the roots have been chopped off when it's bur bald and burlapped. And in any case, it's got to rebuild the root system big enough to support a tree that size. And it can sit there for a day doing that. So if you plant a small tree at the same time, it will, without destroying the root system, it will grow faster uh, than that other tree. It'll catch up and, and pass it. Uh, so, so they don't have to be too expensive, although you can spend a lot of money on it. Are they going to uh, lift up your hardscape? They could if you, if you plant um, over bedrock where the roots have no place to go um, or over agricultural pan where, again, they go laterally. But if you have nice, nice deep soil, uh, they'll go deep. And I show lots of examples of, of uh, that. So it's not inevitable that they're going to lift up your landscape. Nobody's going to recommend a large oak for a tiny yard these days. Although in the old days, the old days they did that, and I can show you lots of examples. Um, so it's not it's it's certainly possible. Um, but we do have small oaks. We've got the uh, um, dwarf chestnut oak. We've got uh, the Georgia oak a little farther south. We've got a dwarf uh, live oak in the south. There are I don't know fifteen or so species of of uh, very small oaks in the west. So there are small oaks that can be used in small landscapes. We don't have to use huge trees. And if you bring those oaks to... Totally. They, they'll grow fast if you're patient in the beginning. It's the tiny trees that are growing slowly because they're building that big root system. Mm -hmm. During the first year of their life, they're spending uh, 10 times more growth on roots than on above ground biomass. But we get impatient. We want instant gratification. So, 
Well, and the reward, of course, is that if you bring those oaks to your yard, you're bringing the insect biomass. You're bringing, and then you're bringing the birds, and you're bringing the other animals. Uh, and and this is something you've seen on your own property, haven't you? Yeah, you know, I've been I've been taking pictures of all the moths on our property since we put the plants back. I'm up to 1,140 species of just moths so far. I haven't gotten to the butterflies, and 30 percent of them are using the oaks in my yard. And which is and that's why we a, call. That's why we call oaks species. They're supporting most of the life. And I was going to say, that's how many acres that you have? It's 10 acres. Uh, and people get discouraged. Oh, I don't have 10 acres. Um, you know, I've, I've got examples of other people like the, the Terpstras in Kirkwood, Missouri. They've got 0. 0.6 acres. Yeah. They've recorded 149 bird species on their yeah. property, plus Here. 35 bird species. Pam Carlson in right Chicago, there. In Pam, yeah. Yeah. yeah, one tenth of an acre. Um, she's got 120 birds that have used her, her yard, including a woodcock. She a picture of a woodcock next to her, her uh, in her backyard. Uh, and of course, if you've got a tiny yard and your neighbor does it too, then it's not so tiny anymore. And if his neighbor does it, then, it's, then you've got your 10 acres. Uh, so, so the object is not to have one person do this. It's to change the culture so that everybody does it, so it becomes the norm. And then we've really made an impact. And that's the idea of Homegrown National Park. And by the way, I have links to all of this stuff, Doug's mm -hmm. books and Homegrown National Park. In, give me the elevator. We need to get to a break, but give me yeah. the elevator speech for Homegrown National Park. Uh, you know, I got the idea, oh, 15 years or so ago, saying what would happen if we cut the area of lawn in half? We've got 40 million acres of lawn in the U.S. That's the size of, of New England. If we cut that in half and put in these plants we're talking about, that's 20 million acres we can put towards conservation. If we do it in our yards, hey, we could create a new national park. How big is 20 million acres? Well, if you add up uh, all the major parks in the country, there's still less than 20 million acres combined. So homegrown national park would be the biggest the biggest mm -hmm. national park. And the, and the object is we've got parks and preserves, but we're in the sixth great extinction. So they're obviously not enough to prevent the disasters we're seeing. We now need to do conservation on private property. So all the private landowners have to contribute. You know, we all need a healthy ecosystem. Everybody on the planet, so everybody's responsible for it. So this is a way that, that uh, everybody can contribute to conservation. Join Homegrown National Park. It's free, by the way. We're, we're trying to build a visual representation of this, this conservation message spreading throughout the, the U.S. And you've got this great uh, map where people can get on the map yeah it's a very expensive map trying to get the the tech guys to make it work but um, <laughs> yeah that's we want it to go viral we're trying to use social media to to get the idea that you are responsible for if you say you're going to own part of the earth okay but you got to take care of it it's not an option to own it and ruin it and that takes us to Bell Bowl Prairie right here in Illinois at uh, Chicago Rockford International Airport. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk to Carrie Lee, who's the executive director of the Natural Land Institute. We're going to get an update. And Doug, love to have you weigh in on that because I'm sure you have some opinions about what's going on there. Uh, and, and I want to know about your experiences in dealing with similar issues. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're talking to Dr. Doug Tallamy. We'll be right back. One of the keys to the success in being able to grow tomatoes all year long is our Procyon 2.0 light we use a 17 inch Procyon light above each of the tomato plants and it's a light which gives you the right intensity of, li of light that's required to grow a tomato as well as the right ratio of red to blue to green light to make the flowers properly blossom and to produce large amounts of tomatoes.
from spring seed and soil treatments to summer foliar feeding to fall stubble digesters, Blazing Star provides microbial tools from tiny biologicals for natural and organic farmers. They have solutions for home gardeners too. And Blazing Star offers agroecological education and consulting, especially for permaculture work in zones four and five. Learn more about these great folks at blazing-star.com. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're very pleased to have Douglas W. Tallamy on the show with us today. He's the author of, uh, the, well, his most recent book is The Nature of Oaks, The Rich Ecology of Our Most Essential Native Trees. Um, and we're happy to bring in Carrie Lee, the executive director of the Natural Land Institute, uh, as you know, on this show for the last four months now. Going on four months, we've been talking about a place called Bell Bowl Prairie, which is a little strip of prairie, 25 acres, that is pretty much completely surrounded by Chicago Rockford International Airport. Um, and the airport recently made plans um, to expand their operations. And the it looked as though, as of August, that Bell Bowl Prairie was going to be a casualty of that. But... Uh, word got out that it was going to happen, um, and there has been an uprising, as I said on an earlier program, among uh, just concerned citizens, but also envir environmentalists uh, and folks who, um, who, who value nature, as Doug Tallamy does. So, uh, Carrie Lee, uh, why don't you give us a, a very brief overview of anything that I missed there and where we are today? Oh, hold on, Carrie. You're, I don't know if that's me or you. It might be me. No, I'm on mute. Oh, okay. I'm there we now. go. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, first, I want to thank you very much for doing the donation to the legal fees. Uh, we're a not-for-profit land trust, and the legal fees, as you can imagine, are a heavy burden for us. Um, so we're very appreciative of that. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, yeah. And happy birthday, by the way. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, back in um, October, the Natural Land Institute filed um, a motion to kind of sue the airport um, to ask them to really um, redesign the road and take the road out of the highest quality of this 8,000 year old ancient dry gravel prairie. There's only about 18 acres left in the state of Illinois of this high quality type of prairie. And as you know, Illinois is known as the prairie state. This is shocking. This is no longer, this type of activity is no longer uh, just a local issue. Um, it's regional and global, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And what is important and what I have seen in terms of my life is a big shift from, we just want to save this whale or we want to save this owl uh, and we want to stop everything and save this, is now we're talking about saving us, which Doug has been talking about so eloquently. But we're also talking about, we think that there are ways that development and the protection of our precious natural resources can coexist hand in hand. And that depends on sensitive design. Um, so we don't want to stop the airport expansion, uh, but we want to talk about using uh, green infrastructure practices, redesigning to protect the, the, um, the prairie. And we don't want to halt anything. We want to have both and. And I think that's part of my hopefulness too, is that with really smart, sensitive design by people who really understand the natural world and understand how, um, we have moved into a sophisticated level 
of design solutions that we can have now both. We can have both. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Oh, well, I was just going to say, um, we, you've uh, been trying to get across the point that you just made that it's not either or, that yeah, there yeah. can be development, but we can save the prairie too. And you've attempted to talk to the airport authority about that. From what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, you've been rebuffed at every occasion? Yeah, they're not interested in talking with us. So we've started a legislative initiative talking with our state senators, uh, our local representatives, um, and really um, taking this to another level. The, the airport just had 60 days to respond to our October um, lawsuit, and their response was to uh, file a motion to dismiss uh, based on no standing. So no standing means that you have no interest in this particular thing. However, the Natural Land Institute has been working with the airport under an agreement with the airport since the late 70s uh, to manage the prairie. Uh, and the previous airport administrations um, acknowledged uh, how important the prairie was. So I think we have a good case. Uh, this will be um, coming up shortly uh, in the middle of uh, February for a hearing. So we'll know more then. And we're ready. You know, we're ready if they decide to uh, say, okay, we, we're going to grant this motion. We're ready to immediately file um, an appeal and to immediately file uh, another temporary restraining order on the airport. Uh, and we're looking at a photo of Bell Bull Prairie. Um, and, and folks might wonder, how, how can this prairie exist, uh, especially if you, if you see the, the photos of the surrounding area? Um, the airport's right there. Uh, in fact, uh, you might actually see, unfortunately, something like this, uh, and that starkly represents what's at stake here on one side there's the there's the bulldozer and then uh on the other side is the prairie uh being ready just who knows what's going to happen at the beginning of march um how is it that the these two can exist together carrie so we have been managing the prairie um for a long time and um, the, the actual prairie uh, does sit in an area of Rockford that has a lot of development, but it also has a lot of natural areas. And we've been working with the Winnebago County Forest Preserves District and other conservation organizations in the region to protect other areas. So it, it, it is a little bit isolated, but in the bigger picture of things, it's not. And the tremendous benefits uh, that this little piece of prairie uh, provides to the airport, even in terms of carbon sequestration, uh, if you're looking at reducing your carbon emissions for an airport, for example. But it's, um, it's part of a bigger picture. And I want people to understand that, that even though it feels a little bit isolated there, it's part of a much, much bigger picture. Now, the rusty patched bumblebee was found there this last summer. And these bees uh, come for several miles for foraging. Uh, this prairie pr provides amazing foraging. Uh, lots of songbirds on this prairie, lots of other small uh, mammals and uh, insects. And this type of ecosystem isn't just about what's above ground. When you think of an 8,000 year old system, you also have to think about what's underground uh, and all of the things that are holding together in place. Uh, and amazing what Doug is calling and talking about is the web of life. So we want to make sure that people understand how important that is. Well, let's get to Doug uh, about this because um, 
part of the reason you're on the show today, Doug, is is I wrote uh, a message to you. Someone had suggested on the Save Belbo Prairie Facebook page. You know, we ought to talk to Doug Tallamy. He he could do something about this. He could lead the lead the charge. And so I wrote immediately to Doug and I said, Doug, here's the situation. And you, what you wrote back to me was was revealing, Doug. Uh, you said that you get requests like this about once a week. Can you explain that? Yeah, there are there are um, tiny little remnants under attack across the country, and groups surrounding them want to save them. And I don't I don't blame them at all. Um, I guess I I'm always feeling a little pressured. I can't get involved in, in all of the uh, you know all the attempts to to save me personally, uh, and I get discouraged because. This all boils down to the elected officials that either support it or not. And, you know, the real way to save these things is to demonstrate enough public support so that those elected officials feel threatened. We're not going to reelect you if you don't uh, take this type of conservation seriously. If that was a, our cultural norm, none of this would ever be an issue. And that's where I want to go. But, um, you know, the and I also... I, I under, I don't appreciate maybe um, how important my voice would be. As a, Doug, they don't even know who Doug Tallamy is, and they're not going to care for one, one second. Uh, but this is a classic case of there's an an analogy out there. If you have a dripping faucet or a dripping pipe in your in your kitchen, it's dripping on the floor, and one drop falls to the floor. It's not a big deal. You wipe it up, and no big problem. But if you go away for two weeks and it drips. You know, once every five minutes, you come back and your your house is flooded. That's what it, this is. One drop, and people say it's just you know it's just eighteen acres. We got a lot of acres out there, but it's adding up all over the place, and that's why every single drop now counts. It's a difficult concept for for people to get, but you know, Belpole Prairie Prairie is it's a virgin prairie that is a genetic treasure trove because because the plants there have genotypes that are no place else. If we're ever going to expand prairies, and I hope that's the eventual uh, situation, we're going to we're going to use seed from these prairies to to. So it's not just 18 acres left. We need the genetic uh, um, stock to be able to do that. So so you know I read one of the solutions. Well, let's just transplant some plants. That's not a prairie anymore. Um, you've got to keep it in, intact. All the interacting parts. So. It is enormously important to try to try to save it, and you know, if anybody does listen to what I say, do it. <laughs> um, and, and and as you say, this goes back to what you say in your books about how disconnected from nature we are. The thought that you could dig up these plants, and even IDNR, yeah. the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, suggesting that well, we'll get our shovels and we'll. We'll, move we'll, it we'll to just an, find the occasional plant, dig them up, and move them. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, shows a, a lack of connection or just an, an inability to to deal with the situation as it exists. But uh, Carrie, as you mentioned earlier, what what is happening here is we're proving that, and as Doug has just said, none of this is local anymore. Yeah. This, you know, it's another rivet being taken mm -hmm. out of the airplane that's my favorite analogy yeah. is that if you're flying across the country and you just start removing rivets from the airplane um, and for a long long time nothing happens which is the rivet that causes mm -hmm. the plane to drop out of the sky which species that collapses and and might it be a keystone species if we have a keystone species collapse then the cascading effect could happen so fast that we would take our breath away. We don't oh, what's know. What's the tipping point where one one too many is gone of a plant, even? You know, you know but, the, yeah, the rest, this amount than that amount. Let's catch bumblebee used to be one of the most common bumblebees in the East, and now now you know there's just a few left. So we're losing the common species that run our ecosystems. We just can't tolerate that. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, in terms of that political thing that you were talking about, too, is a lot of our politicians, including our governor uh, and Senator Durbin, as well as our local politicians, have come out uh, in favor of 
redesigning the road to avoid the prairie and the airport um, isn't listening to them. And in fact, one of our senators, one of our local senators has been contacting the airport regularly and they just don't return his calls. So um, this, is, this is really um, a disturbing uh, kind of turn of events, really, that there's so much resistance. And, you know, it, it's something that I just don't understand. So I, I'm, I'm a little bit bewildered by that. But um, I, I did want to tell Doug that um, we have prairie in our backyard. Uh, and we've had prairie since we moved here in 1994. Uh, and an oak tree that we planted um, in our subdivision. We kind of live in a little village. And just to tell you a story, we a few years ago we had a my brother brought a friend over, and my husband was down in in the prairie weeding, and uh, he said to me, he said, "Why is that guy weeding his weeds?" <laughs> so, you know, wow. it, it was kind of interesting. But what has happened is our neighbors, because we have plants flowering all season long at different times. And our neighbors have become enamored of our prairie because we have a little bit of lawn and we have uh, in our front yard, we have a mix of natives and perennials and people walk by all the time and we do plant sharing. Um, you know, we talk to people about native bees and how we have lots of pollinators. We tell them stories about, you know, sitting in our backyard and watching the songbirds. And in fact, we haven't told this story much, but I was about to take a bite of my dinner on sitting on the back porch and this Cooper's hawk came down and boom, right in front of us, got a bird. And I think I sat there with my mouth open <laughs> for like a good 30 seconds. But nature is like there, it's all around us if we just invite it. And um, we're so grateful that our neighbors uh, have responded really well to um, to our our native uh, backyard. We've forgotten what the definition of a weed is. A weed is a plant out of place. Our native plants are not out of place. That's right. It's, it's the one that's out of place. It's the boxwood. So it's the, the yeah. Those are the exactly. weeds. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so that, you know, the, your voice, Doug, um, in terms of these things, I think it, in some sense, it, it does matter. You were like wondering, oh, does my voice, how much does my voice matter? Uh, particularly when you hear about these things constantly, um, and it must feel a little disheartening. Um, but I, I also think that, there might be a place um, for your voice in the new 30 by 30 campaign. We also yeah. at the Natural Land Institute, we have um, joined the uh, Illinois initiative for the 30 by 30 campaign. Would you, would you explain there, what that is, uh, yes, Carrie? I'm absolutely gonna explain that, which President Biden signed uh, because it's an international campaign, but we're bringing it down to the state level and it's to protect 30% of our natural resources in 30 years, by 2030, so that um, we can do that globally and we can do it locally. And um, I think that is a big lofty goal. And it's something that we can take a look at on all kinds of levels, including uh, we have an initiative at the Natural Land Institute on uh, integrating conservation with agriculture. Uh, and we have a couple of farms where we're doing conservation practices and we're putting up birds nests, nest bo nesting boxes, and we're looking at the uh, pollinator insects for the crops. And I, I think we need to take this beyond into other industries like agriculture, for example. Uh, as well as people's homes. The, the other initiative is a conservation at home initiative uh, that in Illinois we have, I don't know other states use this, it was developed by one of the local land trusts. 
And I'm interested to hear that you have this mapping, Doug, because in Illinois here, we have mapping for our conservation at home. Uh, and we give certificates to people who uh, meet the criteria and we assist people who don't meet the criteria with um, coming up to, to bringing conservation at home. Uh, and then they get to have a, a plaque in their yard and um, really bringing this concept of nature into people's backyards more into the mainstream through these two campaigns, through the 30 by 30 and through the conservation at home, conservation, it's also conservation at work. Uh, and a lot of faith-based communities are, are now doing this as well. So um, I think in many cases, Doug, your voice has been heard. And I think it's not just environmentalists. I think it's also other people like my neighbors uh, who see this, uh, snowball effect um, mm -hmm. of having, and they're just thrilled. They're, they've our neighbors have started putting up bird boxes and bee things, and uh, they're all just. Um, we're hoping it spreads throughout the entire village. I also am an advocate. I got elected to our village board. I changed the ordinances in our village uh, to allow. Uh, native plants in our yards because there are many cities and villages that do not allow uh, plants above a certain height. Uh, that's been an issue uh, for forever. Um, the city of and Chicago. Yeah, yeah, we deal with that all the time yeah. on this show. It's 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 exactly. insane. So so people people also need to be advocates and do those do that kind of work. Um, so I think your voice is really important, Doug, and we, you know, we really, really appreciate you. Well, thank you. Uh, we're, I will keep talking. <laughs> yeah, well, we're trying not to get you sucked into the maelstrom here, uh, Doug, but uh, um, yeah. there are people, uh, uh, folks watching now who are writing and, 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 and they are saying you are an important voice. And and yeah. and I think you don't have to advocate specifically for Bell Bowl Prairie because you advocate for everything, uh, and it's all, it's we need to advocate for every single yeah. acre of land that is in danger of of being paved over or bulldozed or turned into something awful, as as you as you point out in your book, ninety five percent of America has had that happen to it already. Whether it's lawns, yeah. whether it's 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 asphalt, whatever. We need to learn to coexist with nature, and having a prairie right in the middle of the airport is a perfect example. We can do it. They can move the road. I think we know. I mean, maybe it's a little bit more expensive. What would it cost? How do we get around that? There's ways to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, uh, just not listening. Before I, I want to listen. Before I let you go, Carrie, uh, I understand from talking to folks. Uh, uh, involved in this, that you actually have had meetings with Senator Tammy Duckworth's staff, not her in person. Uh, right. But um, you see, it seems to me we're at the point where the local senators are not going to have any effect on this. It's going to have to be the big guns that come out and say, uh, you know, either the governor or one of our two uh, senators um, uh, is going to have to step up. And, 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 and it's interesting that our one of our previous governors back in the 70s actually did step up because the bulldozers were set to destroy this prairie then. And he stopped it, whereas our and he was a Republican governor and uh, he was an advocate for the prairie. Our current governor has kind of been milk toast about it. Uh, and he's a Democrat and we really want our governor to take a stance. And we have been bombarding him, of course, with lots of uh, lots of letters and information. So we still are appealing to our governor um, to uh, make his voice stronger. So I want to thank you all so much for having me on the show uh, and uh, for everybody who's continuing to advocate for this important piece of Illinois. Thank you so much.
Oh, you're welcome, Carrie. And um, I, I'm with you there. I think, uh, unfortunately, I think all of the politicians have been kind of milk toast about this right now because not one has said, you know what, we need to stop. Now, I mean, not even say we need to save the prairie, which would be great, but we just need to stop and you guys need to sit down together. Somebody's got to well, somebody's got to knock yeah. some heads together here, and I and I, is that yeah. happening? Well, we're we're hopeful. We're still talking with them, but one of the things that I did want to mention is that uh, we the uh, Illinois has given the airport three and a half million dollars towards this, and they can use that money, some of that money, for the redesign of this road. Uh, so we um, we're we're hopeful that if the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration steps up um, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service, our lawsuit is also against the Department of Interior, which includes mm -hmm. the Fish and Wildlife Service for not, because they are not protecting the habitat of the bee. Um, so we're, we're still working on that. So thank you everybody mm -hmm. who's, yeah. Well, we held that three million, that would be a leverage, I'd say, I, you know, there's a, yeah. there's a, there's a uh, a responsibility yeah. that goes receiving this. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, Carrie Lee, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to swap you out for, uh, with, the, our, our next guest, uh, because she's coming on after, um, 10 o'clock, but I wanted to make sure that, uh, she gets a chance to, uh, say hello to, uh, Doug Cal and maybe... Quick. Thank real you, and it was good Carrie to meet you, Doug. What? Carrie, real quick before you disappear, because we're getting a bunch of questions. How can people get sure. involved? Who do they write to? So if you go to savebellbowlprairie.org, it's a website, and on that website is an action alert that sends letters. You can just sign up two or three clicks, and it sends letters to all of our legislators, local, state, uh, national, uh, to support the prairie. And we've had over 4,000 uh, responses. Uh, it's growing over 35,000 letters. So please go to savebellbowlprairie.org. So much information there on how you can get involved. Yeah, that's a wonderful resource. It's a wonderful website. You can keep up with day-to-day -day activity by going to the Facebook page, Save Bell Bull Prairie. Uh, you can donate to the legal fund because this ain't cheap. Yeah. Uh, and folks need to be aware, this is January 23rd. The, uh, the, the airport authority has agreed to hold off on doing anything until March 1st. So if you're looking at the doomsday clock, we're at five minutes to midnight right now that's the reality of the situation and there is no indication at this point that the authority is willing to even talk to the people who are trying to save the prairie that 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 is the thing that just boggles my mind carrie that they will not even sit down this is this, this is a group that is dug in its heels and said you're not going to win this we're not going to let you win this um and when the fate of the planet in some ways is at stake. That's a terrible response. Just and this awful. could be such this could be such a win-win for the for Rockford and for the airport. So thank you to all your listeners. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Peggy. And good to meet you, Doug. Nice to meet you as well. And good luck to it. All thank right. You. Thank you, Carrie. Now I bring in uh, Deborah Barons and I and I wanted to do this because um, Deborah uh, we're going to be talking about a prairie success story. Doug, you won't have to stick around for all of that in the next half hour, but we will be talking to Deborah. But part of the reason she's here is because you're going to be speaking to her organization, the Prairie Enthusiasts. Uh, in fact, there's a couple of uh, uh, speaking dates that folks should know about. One is with the Prairie Enthusiasts on February 19th. And uh, Doug's doing the Keystone address, isn't he, Deborah? Keynote. I'm sorry, Keynote. A key, a keystone species, Keynote address. Ah, it's all the same thing. <laughs> Wait. Oh, we've lost your audio again, Deb. Oh, no. Wait. Is it you? Nope. 
boy, we had that issue before the show. So, okay, I'll tell you what, I will, you're, you're going to have to, uh, yeah, she's going to have to re reconnect. But I will let folks know that you're doing the keynote address for the Prairie Enthusiast virtual conference. Uh, and it is virtual, and it's actually four days, the 16th through the 19th. Um, and you can go to my website, MikeNovak.net, and click on the link there. But you're also speaking here in Illinois, and this is an in-person event which uh, was a little surprising to me, but the COVID-19 protocols will be applied uh, at the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. It's at their 31st annual celebration brunch, uh, and that is on the 30th. So that is next Sunday, um, and you're doing a, a brunch for them. And, and as you mentioned, you're all over the place, uh, Doug. You, uh, you're, you're doing a lot of speaking, and you're reaching a lot of people, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. Um, are you back with us, Deborah? By any chance? Am I? Yes, you are. Yes, I don't. Are. I don't. I don't know why your audio <laughs> keeps popping off. But very I briefly, um, uh, introduce yourself to Doug and and tell us a little bit about uh, the uh, the virtual conference on the twenty second, where Doug will be speaking. Yeah, actually, the nineteenth is. When I'm, Doug sorry, is I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The twenty second. No. I'm sorry. I said. Uh, That's yeah. okay. That's okay. So yeah, the Prairie Enthusiast is looking forward to welcoming you, Doug. Um, we're actually going to be together the 16th through the 19th for a virtual conference. Uh, registration is live now. People want to head to theprairieenthusiast.org and sign up. Um, all of the material that's available through our virtual conference is going to be on the site for three months. So it's going to be a great learning opportunity. If you feel like you can't participate live, you can come back and check out the, the sessions, including Doug's session for three months after the conference. So really encourage people to be a part of that. Fantastic. Um, and you have a prairie success story. So um, after all of us talking about doom and gloom here, uh, we're going to hear about that story. Doug Tallamy, I cannot thank you enough for doing this. And uh, I know that our, our viewers um, really appreciate the fact that uh, you're fighting so hard for our natural areas. Well, uh, thanks for the opportunity, Mike. This is, this is one of the easiest things for me to do. So anytime you want to set it up, I'm ready. I'm going to take you at your We're word. We're going to take you up on that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you better be ready. Okay, can you come back next week? Oh no, wait. You're you you've got it. Oh, flying in an air. Right. Yeah. 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 It yeah makes so. makes me wonder if you're flying into uh, Chicago Rockford International. I have no idea. Uh oh. Probably flying not. out of Chicago. I'm flying into Milwaukee because there's a talk before that. Ah. Uh, Wow, you just line them up. You just stack them up one after another. Mm -hmm. I just answer my email. <laughs> <laughs> well, be safe. Be, right. uh, be and, well. Uh, nice we'll see you on the 19th. All right. It's the Mike Novak, show, soon, with, Mike Novak show with yeah. Peggy Malecki. Uh, Deborah Barron's is next, so stick around. A garden designer once told me, start with winter when choosing your plants. And I can see why. Here we are, the middle of January, it's freezing cold, and looking around, there's just not a whole lot of appeal in the way of color. As the holiday season wraps up and we're taking our lights down, it always cheers me up to walk past this plant, Ilex reticulata, otherwise known as the winterberry holly. Now, the berry from a holly can bring a little joy into any landscape, but what makes this species so spectacular is it's deciduous. So these wintertime berries don't share the spotlight with any foliage. It's a true eye catcher, but realize that it's not just catching your eye. The birds will make an absolute feast out of these berries. But with any luck, this fruit will persist well into the winter months and even into springtime, depending on where you're at. It's native from as far north as Nova Scotia all the way down to Florida and as far west as Ontario, Wisconsin, and Missouri. Now, it prefers the wet, swampy areas, but I've seen it do well in a variety of landscape situations. We planted this one right next to the downspout, and it's doing just fine. Now, Ilex reticulata is dioecious, which means this is a female plant, and it requires pollination from a male plant. The male plant should be planted within 100 yards or so of this one, otherwise the berries won't be produced. They'll do okay in partial shade, but they'll do much better in full sun. 
As far as the concerns for this plant, I mean possibly some fungal disorders, but nothing that can't be easily managed. And also easily managed is the pruning. This is not a giant. They'll get about six to 10 feet tall and roughly about the same in width. So I would encourage you to consider one of these plants in your landscape if you're anywhere from zone three to nine. It's a great winter plant that stops you in your tracks and might bring a little bit of cheer to an otherwise bleak winter's day. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a sip on of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music, porches, lawn serene. Give me all that I can take. And welcome back. Yes, you're there, Deborah, and I think I can even hear you, which is uh, even better. <laughs> I am here. I'm having a chuckle at the two of you dancing away. Yeah, <laughs> it's what we do with uh, with with the music. I wish I could play more music on the show, but all that would happen is that YouTube would flag me and say, "Hey, you don't have the rights to that." So, okay, whatever. Um, and uh, I'm so happy to have you on the show. And uh, we slopped over a little bit into the ten o'clock hour. I, I'm I hope you realize it was in a worthy cause. Um, uh, Absolutely. Yes. It's not often that we get Doug Tallamy on the show. And I want to thank all the folks who are watching and continue to watch because they need to hear about what happens if things go right um, in uh, an area where you can save land. Um, and that's what's happening with the prairie enthusiasts. Uh, well, first of all, before we get to that story, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the prairie enthusiasts. Yeah, well, I have been in the fortunate position of being with the Prairie Enthusiasts for a little bit over a year now. I'm relatively new as the executive director, but our organization started as grassroots volunteers um, throughout the upper Midwest, kind of coming together to realize that they had a shared interest in these remnant prairies like Belle Bowl Prairie. Um, we have a number of them in Wisconsin. Our region has expanded to include Minnesota and also Northwest Illinois. We have a chapter there now, too. Fantastic. Um, and uh, so there is this prairie that already exists in Wisconsin. It's, it's near Madison, yeah. Wisconsin, and it's called Mounds View Grasslands Preserve. Um, and you were just able to purchase... Uh, a, a place called the Hanley Farm um, to well, add. Well, we're just about to purchase, actually. Oh, yes. okay. We're planning to close. So we've been really busy over the last year or so securing the funding that we need to add about 350 acres to an existing 570-acre preserve. So you want to think about being able to see what these prairie environments looked like and this is a really rare, um, one of the largest prairie preserves that we have in the country. Thanks to the Hanley acquisition, which we're looking forward to this spring, um, we're really excited about what that can mean for species that are endangered and threatened and make their home there at the grasslands. Well, I want to show something here that uh, you alerted me to. It's very short, um, a little video uh, that, that, that sets it up. Uh, let's take a look. Take a look at this. The Mounds View Grassland Preserve here is the largest preserve of the prairie enthusiasts. This is a, a, a really large landscape scale project. And the Hanley property is, is almost like the missing piece in the jigsaw puzzle. It's an important opportunity to connect to something that doesn't exist many places anymore. I think anybody who sees the Hanley property will conclude that it is a piece of heaven. And I would really like my children and grandchildren to know that I played a part in helping to preserve that piece of heaven for future generations to see.
and there we go. And it does look lovely. I mean, um, and there's no airport surrounding it either. So you don't, you don't have to worry about that, do you? Well, not yet. Um, oh. so this prairie landscape is actually just about 30 miles away from Madison, which is a growing um, metropolitan area. And um, the area has been developing. And so when we think about prairie and what this landscape was when European settlers came to the area, it was thousands of acres of prairie. But today, less than 1% of that prairie remains in the upper Midwest. So the prairie enthusiast has really worked hard to identify where do we have that remnant prairie, like we have that Bel with the Balboa Prairie in some of these other regions, and what can we do to protect it? And then kind of create a little bit of a buffer zone around it so that those remnant prairies can expand and we can work on restoring some of that surrounding landscape too. Well, you sent me a, I, you just saw the map of, of where the, uh, the prairie is, but you sent me a, a map of the, the grass and hay coverage. Can, uh, are you familiar yeah, let's with that? Look at that. Yeah. Cause yeah. I, I, I wasn't can sure what, what I was, what, what I was looking at here. Yeah, so um, you can kind of see the outline of Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, and Iowa there. And that heat map that shows the red area, that is um, where this prairie we're protecting, where our Mounds View Grasslands um, Preserve is located. And there are several nonprofits, including um, county, state, and federal agencies that have really focused attention on protection in this area because it has critical habitat for grassland birds and other species that require grasslands in order to breed. Um, and as we've seen from some of the recent data coming out, these birds are seriously critically threatened. All right. Um, and when, so what about the, the hay coverage? I mean, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. we're not talking crops here though, are we? Right. So there's actually this group that's come together, a coalition of those county, state, and federal agencies, as well as a number of other nonprofits doing work in this area. We mm -hmm. call ourselves the Southern Driftless Grasslands Partnership. Um, and it's actually through the partnership that we've had an opportunity to attract significant funding for what we're trying to protect with this acquisition of the Hanley Farm as a, at our Mountain mm -hmm. View Grasslands Preserve. Um, so a number of us are really seeing this as an opportunity to protect as much land as possible, to work with farmers in the area, to educate them on the importance of, for those who have grasslands on their property, keeping that grassland intact so that birds can continue to breed in the area, as well as other endangered species. Why is it called driftless? Yeah, great question. So um, we, those of us who live in the Driftless love the Driftless, um, mm -hmm. but we get that question from people who are outside of it quite a and, bit. And just so folks what know, it, we're saying D-R-I-F-T-L-E-S-S, -S, Driftless. Yes. Which and what that is referring to. Theological term. Sorry, go ahead, Peggy. Yeah. I was going to say it's a re theological it's, term. Yep. It's referring to actually the glacial drift which um, the pressure of two glacial drifts kind of um, collided and caused one another to come to a stop. And the glaciers actually never glaciated this particular section of a little corner of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa, we call the Driftless. Uh, and, and there you can, you yeah. can see it right there. Um, okay, the big question is, uh, for folks who, you know, we're, we're trying to raise uh, a few thousand dollars to uh, go to the legal fee for Save Bell Bowl Prairie. You guys got eight, more than $800,000. How does that happen to, for, for a not-for-profit? Oh. I'm still pinching myself every time I hear it, Mike. Um, we kind of can't believe it. But the way that it happened is through that Southern Driftless Grasslands partnership. All of the groups aligned with that partnership said this protection of the Hanley Farm is the most protection, most important protection opportunity we have in the region, in the state of Wisconsin, um, in the upper Midwest right now when it comes to preserving that habitat for endangered and threatened species. 
So the Wisconsin DNR actually is our hero. They went to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and said, um, hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is the most important priority property for us right now. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, through their Endangered um, Species Fund, agreed to grant this $895,000 to the prairie enthusiasts for the acquisition. But I do have to say one more thing, Mike, and that's that, you know, that's only represents about a third of the overall total cost for the expansion mm -hmm. of the preserve that we're working on. And the rest of that funding has come through private sources, gifts of $25 to $250,000. But people who have seen that site and said, this is important, this is worth protecting, this is truly unique, and we need this not just for Wisconsin, but for the planet. That's uh, that's an amazing story, and the fact that other people are are stepping up as well, and that's that's the way it should work. Um, you guys sent out a a release about this, um, about how important the Hanley Farm is. It's one of Wisconsin's few unplowed prairies, uh, making it especially valuable for its rich biodiversity. Uh, and you're going to be able to create a large contiguous property of conservation land. Um, and that that itself is such a rarity. The Hanley Farm is home to more than two dozen rare and endangered species of plants, animals, insects, reptiles, and birds. Examples include the upland sandpiper, Henslow sparrow, Bell's vireo, uh, red-headed woodpecker, regal fritillary butterfly, red-tailed leafhopper, and Pickerel frog. Okay. Wait, wait. And one would probably presume the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, yeah, I would guess. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in honor yeah. of that, okay. I have to do my my frog. I haven't pulled out the frog in a long time. The frog uh, returns. The frog returns. <laughs> um, let me show uh, a, a couple of photographs here because it is a, a pretty remarkable piece of property. There we go, um, and that looks that looks like uh, summer to me or late spring uh, that we're talking about. I don't know if you want to comment on on any of these photos, but um, well, I just you know you pull this photo up, Mike, and I immediately think of the, the conversation earlier when uh, I think Carrie was talking about how um, she had a friend who was talking about someone weeding their weeds. Um, and I look at that and do those look like weeds? No, those no, are not weeds. Not um, at all. That is a glorious, beautiful landscape, but we don't have a memory anymore for what mm -hmm. these places look like unless we protect and restore them. You know, that is something that that comes across uh, every time we talk about these issues. Uh, smart people, smarter than I, uh, talk about how we don't have that institutional memory anymore. We don't even know what mm -hmm. prairies used to look like. We obliterated them um, two centuries ago, not, or a century and a yeah. half, really, century and yeah. a half ago, it, it, with the, with the mm -hmm. the uh, invention of uh, the plow, um, which is either the greatest tool ever invented or the worst. It's you know it's up for debate at the moment. Um, and uh, and so yeah, when you you see a, a, a photo like that, or or as um, Cindy Crosby said when she was on the show in December, she said, "Yes, yeah, she knows about the prairies because when she was a little girl and her family would drive across the country, that was the stuff she was trying to get past so she could get to something interesting. She could get uh, to the city. flyover yeah. zone. The flyover <laughs> zone. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of it wasn't prairie. A lot of it was just agricultural land. Mm -hmm. You know, corn and soybeans." Um, Although she's uh, uh, she's not as old as I am, but she's been around the block a couple of times. Um, so here's a, a, another photograph, and that's a seed yes. gathering a seed gathering day, isn't it? Yes. Um, actually, the title of this photo is uh, uh, something to the effect of "Working with the Master." The gentleman in the center is Rich Henderson, and he is the site steward for the property. He's a volunteer. He works at that site more than 40 hours a week, um, that and other sites that we have at the Prairie Enthusiasts. And it's such a significant amount of work that he actually has about a half dozen other site um, 
steward leaders all volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some staff and interns that occasionally do work, some contractors on projects, but everyone who's with him in that photo is a volunteer. And they're out in that prairie learning about what's there, um, helping to gather seed, because we then will use that seed to um, prescribed burn um, and then overseed to encourage that prairie to expand. Well, if they would get rid of some of those weeds, they could see the flowers they're trying to right. get seeds from. Uh -huh. right? uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and oh, here's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know a little mm -hmm. Leatrice or Leatrice or however yeah. you want to pronounce it. Um, mm -hmm. um, and tucked in the, the right hand corner, I see a little bit of prairie smoke kind of on its yeah. way out. Um, yeah. Uh, and one more here. Uh, and uh, it's yeah, just... so what you see there, too, are some um, oak trees. Uh, in addition to the contiguous prairie that we have at the Mounds View Grasslands Preserve, we also have an oak savanna that we're actively restoring, as well as a cold water stream and some wetlands that we're doing restoration on, too. All right. So there's you still have to make the purchase. And once that's done, I imagine there's there's inventory. Um, find out what you have. Really, I, do you exactly? Do, do you even know exactly what you're getting? I mean, I'm sure you the Hanley Farm people have let you tour to see what's there, but you really won't know until you have complete control over it. Well, actually, Mike, so more than just let us tour, we have been working with um, members of the Hanley family for generations. Um, oh, okay. And they have let us, um, they have some remnant prairie on their property in addition to grasslands um, that have been in place for 30 years. They have remnant prairie and we've been working with them to restore that prairie. So, you know, you talk about this memory and the family talks about the idea of this property going to the prairie enthusiasts. They're excited to see it return to the memories that their grandmother shared with them about what the property looked like. Mm -hmm. It's been in the family for 140 years and what that property looked like when they first settled in the area. So as they like wave goodbye to their family farm, they're confident they're leaving it in good hands and we're going to return the, it. Their to legacy. What it once was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. I, uh, I would like you to explain um, what is the difference? You, you mentioned grassland, you mentioned prairie, uh, mm -hmm. and there's obviously What's a diff the difference. Yeah. yeah. What is the difference? Yeah. So the remnant prairie is land that has, as you said, not gone under a plow. It has not been subjected to overgrazing. Um, it may have been grazed at some point by animals, but not overgrazed. So what we have there is a plant community that has evolved. Actually, at our Mounds View site, I had to write this down because I wanted to share it with you. The geology at that site is 450 million years old. Wow. Well, because that glacial drift did not come across, yeah. that's ancient soil. Exactly. And so the remnant prairie is the prairie where it has, like that plant community has been untu untouched. It's continued to co-evolve. Um, and there are relationships there within the native prairie that we don't even understand. We're still learning mm -hmm. things. And there's a lot of research going on at our Mounds View site to kind of get a better sense of what are these dynamics within a prairie so that we can learn then how best to go about our restoration. So the difference then with grassland is that at some point it would have been grazed or it would have um, gone under a plow, but it's been planted into grass um, through um, the USDA um, has from time to time provided opportunities for farmers to enroll their land in grassland programs. Um, and so they'll plant it into grass and the Hanley family has had about a substantial um, amount of acreage of their farm that was planted into grassland this way and then has not been plowed for 30 years. So what that does is give us a head start because when mm -hmm. we um, do own the property, We'll be able to burn that grassland through a prescribed burning process and then overseed it, some of that seed collection that you saw, to encourage prairie to get established. It takes some time. It requires a long-term view, but the results of just, you know, restoration happening at that site for the last 20 years, you saw in some of those photos. It's really beautiful. 
All right, we have to wrap up, but uh, quickly, what's what's next for the prairie enthusiasts? Uh, you you reach into Illinois, parts of Minnesota, certainly Wisconsin. Uh, any other big projects on the horizon? Yes, actually, um, that that heat map that you saw with that um, land that um, we're really looking to protect and preserve for grassland mm -hmm. species, um, birds that rely on it. There are a number of um, properties that are going to be coming up in the next five to 10 years. One in particular that is um, coming onto the market right now that we are really hopeful we can find um, some financial support to be able to protect, but we think it's likely going to go onto the market and we'll lose that opportunity. So there are things happening all the time. This is real estate. It moves fast. Um, and so we're constantly looking for partners who care about this and want to be part of the solution. Uh, and of course, I want to remind folks that your conference is is coming up, your, your annual conference. Uh, that is uh, from the 16th to the 19th of February. It is the Prairie Enthusiast Virtual Conference 2022, the keynote address by uh, Doug Tallamy, as we mentioned earlier. That will be on the 19th, and folks should sign up. Uh, I've got the link uh, here uh, on uh, my website at the mikenovak.net, but you can go to www.theprairieenthusiast.org to get more information. Uh, Deborah, thank you so much. It's so good to have uh, a feel good story, a success yeah. story. Congratulations. And, yeah, congratulations. Thank you. And good luck uh, uh, bringing it all together. And that's a place I have to visit very, very soon. Thank you. Hey, I hope we'll see you guys in February at our conference. Okay. All right. It's the Mike <laughs> Novak Show with uh, Peggy Malecki. Guess what? There's snow outside. Meteorologist Rick really? DeMaio is here um, before I shovel. So we'll talk to him next. <laughs> From spring seed and soil treatments to summer foliar feeding to fall stubble digesters, Blazing Star provides microbial tools from Tinyo Biologicals for natural and organic farmers. They have solutions for home gardeners too. And Blazing Star also offers agroecological education and consulting, especially for permaculture work in zones four and five. Learn more about these great folks and great techniques at blazing-star.com. After age 65, immunity starts to wane. Your immune system just isn't as strong as it used to be. And that's why it is important for people age 65 and older to get a booster dose of vaccine. Boosters are a standard way of reminding our immune system about a bacteria or a viral pathogen that we want to have a strong response with antibodies and killer T cells to block that pathogen before it causes severe disease. One of the other advantages in using our Happy Leaf Lights to grow your tomatoes at home is they use very little energy. Um, they're using about 30 watts of energy. So if they're on for 16 hours a day, it's less than a nickel per day to run the lights. All the other costs are some seeds, some nutrients, which are also very inexpensive. And um, you can actually grow your own tomatoes that are pesticide free indoors, in your basement, in a closet, anywhere you want. And we are showing you how to do that. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Got to turn some lights on there, Rick. Um, yeah, I know. I'm getting there. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Open well, the window. Let the reflected snow light come well, through. Let the sun nice shine. Though. Oh, wait. There is no sunshine. Not at the... Yeah, well, there is. It's, it's brilliant light. blue sky. Yeah, you're right. It. I can see bit. some bit. light up out there. So, uh, I've got brilliant blue sky and, and the... Snow on the oak yeah, trees yeah. out the window looks really pretty. Yeah, well, I have something that we're going to, uh, I think we'll just put in the background and play uh, during our segment today. You'll appreciate this. What's that? 
Yeah. Oh, wow. Cool. Pancake ice. Pancake ice. There you go. This was sent to me by our viewer, uh, Bob Cosera. Bob is a great guy. He sends me stuff all the time. He lives along Lake Michigan, and he sent this video, and so I just looped it. So what we'll do is we'll just sit here and get seasick slowly uh, <laughs> as, as we watch Pancake Ice on Lake Keep Michigan. Keep your eyes on the horizon. That's right. It's just lull us to sleep and just... <laughs> Oh my god, but it's it's so cool. I took some photos of it. I was there last week too and got some great shots of pancake oh. ice, but this was the best because I didn't have a video of it and he just he just sent this to me. So that's that's pretty awesome stuff. So I'm, I'm sure it's even I'm sure it's even better today, uh, with the uh, that north northeast wind that developed and um, the fact that temperatures um, have cooled down quite a bit. So this is um this is this is your grandpa's Alberta clipper. How about that? <laughs> okay. All right, and and would and, and there were some people at the uh, at the lake that day, and they said, "Why do they call it pancake ice?" And I I don't think I explained it properly. Explain why it's no, well, I know what it looks like, but how does it how does pancake, pancake ice form? Oh well, that's a different question. Well, it um, is. You're right. Yeah. Uh, well, it forms because if you think about it, it's being it's being hit from all sides um, in a very um, if you want to call it nonlinear way. So because it has the ability to float, it's going to move around. It's going to be hit from the left, hit from the right, mm -hmm. hit from the top, hit from the bottom. And because it's being able to move around and also water ends up coming on the top of it, you'll get that kind of um, um, edge to it, as you can see right there. But the fact that the, the, in, the, the actions that are being put towards it and then the actions that are being um then kind of re-radiated from the center uh creates that kind of you know roundish look to it More um, like a so pan what, pizza you know, than a pancake you're right um, yeah yeah if you want to chicagoize the term peg uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, put it this way put it this way south of devon avenue we'll call it pan pan pizza ice and north of devon <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can we get deep dish pan pizza ice and thin pan pizza yeah, ice? Yeah, pan thrown, right. pan tossed. Yeah. <laughs> so Rick, Rick, is the pancake ice a phenomenon specific to the Great Lakes or does it happen on inland lakes as well? Well, no, it'll happen. Um, it probably won't happen as much on inland lakes because you don't have the stronger wind flow uh, that's going to move around. Action. Right. So it will happen a lot. In inland lakes, if you notice, people will say, why is there more ice on small lakes than the large lakes? It's because the small lakes have a much smaller surface area. There's less wind, and as the ice kind of freezes from the outside in, it'll form such a strong bonding. The ice is really amazing. Ice and water obviously has that property that most, um, you know, most molecules don't have, which has the ability to stretch and expand. You know, when water gets cold, it expands, but you can also form it. If you think about it, um, there's lots of other types of liquids that don't have that lattice structure uh, when ice forms. You know, it has that, if you think about it, it has that kind of horizontal back and forth, which makes it really strong to walk on. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of lot of liquid substances that, that don't do that. And that's one of the reasons why you can form it, you know, in, in large lakes like Peg was alluding to. Uh, but when you look at, I think one way of looking at it differently from like river ice jams, River ice jams are more horizontal because they're being forced in the same direction. So they're being, mm -hmm. they're being hit, but they're also moving forward and they're breaking apart and you're not going to get that kind of rounded nature. So yeah, there's a lot of science to ice. In fact, um, on Tuesday, um, I'm actually chairing a session for the American Meteorological Society because everything has gone virtual. Um, and one of the discussions that we're doing um, is why does Utah have such great snow? Um, and these are two meteorologists from the National Weather Service office out of Salt Lake that are talking about the greatest snow on earth. Um, <laughs> is, no, seriously, which is the Utah area? And a lot of it has to do with the way uh, that the, the moisture comes in from the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. You really don't get a lot of Gulf of Mexico moisture in the area, which is different from what Colorado gets. Uh, but there's parts of Colorado, like the Telluride area, that gets that kind of Utah-like snow. But there actually are different types of crystals in that area, um, as opposed to, say, the mountains of Washington and British Columbia, which is largely wet. 
and then the East Coast is wet, and then you have Colorado, which is a combination of wet and dry. So if you really think about it, that area of Utah has some very different type of uh, not only snow crystals, but also how the snow is uplifted on the mountains as well. So being that we're talking about pancake ice and river ice and things like that, I might as well throw the, the snow part in as well. Yeah, and the fact that we got four and a half inches of snow, this is like Utah snow. I mean, I cleaned off my car and all I really needed was my arm uh, because it literally, <laughs> it literally just blew off. Of course. I mean, Jack, you could probably yeah, just Jack. go and, and get rid of it. So that's what I'm going to do on my porch. So Yeah, and, and this is the kind of snow that we should be getting. But the fact that it took all the way until the 23rd of January to have a decent snow around here um, – you know, really says a lot by how this winter has been going. Wait a second. Wait a second. We, we've we got a special report here. Uh-oh. Fuzzy memories. Fuzzy memories. <laughs> and good evening. Welcome to News Scope again. I'm Patrick Muldowney. Well, we're back again after a one-hour break. We were on the air today for more than 10 hours, bringing you Chicago's information on what was happening in the city and the surrounding area. We used the facilities of the Chicago <laughs> News and the Chicago Sun-Times, as well as Channel 32's own facilities, and the facility of ham radio station WA9. We've got to get RGT, the ham guys out. Jim Roper and Dick Cox at the controls. We'll have a report from them later in News Co. Here in well, the Chicago are. area, we tend to think of this as our storm. Actually, it hit most of the state and even neighboring states. For our regional weather report, we go to Harlan Drager in the city room of the Chicago Daily News. The snowstorm that slammed into Chicago's midsection has left a wide surrounding area in a state of near paralysis. For suburbanites, as well as city residents, the word is... This is when news was news, Rick. Uh, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to move this forward because I want to show this guy... Uh, uh, I like the typewriter behind him. Well, this guy is great. All right, here we are. Oh, yeah. Smoking Smoke the cigarette. Yeah, I know. That's the best yeah, part. Look at it. He's got the cigarette. Well... It's just about over with, although it isn't all over with completely because, uh, as you just heard, the temperatures are still going down. The Weather Bureau tells me that bitterly cold weather is going to hit Chicago by dawn. They say the uh, temperature is going to go down to about 10 degrees above zero before dawn, so it isn't really all over with. And, the, and you can uh, see this is the newsroom that never course, sleeps. Uh, Chicago River over there, so it's 22 degrees right now, and it's still hey, Mike, sort of going yeah. down, so I don't know what's going to happen. Stop it right now. Right okay. now, stop Stop it right there. Yep. Okay. Notice notice um, underneath his left elbow. See that newspaper there? Yeah. Yeah. What does it say on there? W wait yeah, a second. I sec. was trying to read that headline right, when well, I watched it the other day. Let's see. Chicago River over there. So it's, uh, uh, it's still sort of. When he gets down. up. Three assassinated. No, three. No, three. No. Astro. Astronauts. Three astronauts astronauts oh, yeah, killed. That's right. Apollo. Yeah, that was Apollo. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Yeah. So that that was uh, the accident that killed Virgil Grissom um, and two other astronauts on the launch pad. Uh, that was when there was a spark in one of the oxygen tank oxygen right. tanks. Well, yeah. um, and um, he died on January twenty seventh, nineteen sixty seven, uh, which was the anniversary of the Great Chicago Blizzard. Now, the weird thing about that particular storm. And there's a couple of weird things about it was my height, my junior high school, uh, when I attended um, seventh, eighth and ninth grade, they called it an intermediate school. Um, the school was named after Virgil Grissom. So I actually went to Virgil Grissom Junior High School. All right. And when I saw that, I'm like, wow, that's weird. I know all about Virgil Grissom and the fact that he was killed on the day of the Chicago blizzard, which I had been teaching about in class for probably 10 or 15 years at that point, I didn't know that. And then about five years later, my mother picks up uh, this, shows me this um, photograph of my dad and my three brothers and myself. Um, so there's four boys and my sister. And there's me, um, four year old kid with my dad at the beach, uh, Rockaway Beach, Queens, and a ship had run aground. And I had no idea why the ship ran aground. I did some research and the ship ran aground because on the north, on the east side of that blizzard of 1967, we had 50 to 60 mile an hour winds along the coast of New Jersey and it blew that ship on up into Rockaway Beach. Wow. And for years, my mother just had January blank, blank, 1967. 
And I'm like, mom, what, when was this picture taken? She says, oh, I don't know. It was really windy that day. So I did some research and here I am talking about this storm for all these years, not realizing that I had a connection to it at four years old because I was on the beach in Rockway Beach, Queens, because the big yeah. storm that came through Chicago blew this huge tanker um, onto shore. And then I later find out that the school that I went to was named after Virgil Grissom, who happened to die the day of that same storm. So it was really weird sometimes yeah. when you hear about yeah. stuff. And the then I saw it, right, but Pagan, then I saw it in the video and I'm like, whoa, here I am showing this video. I'm like, three astronauts killed. Yeah. Here's a here's a cover of the Chicago Sun-Times that has something that I had found out about. So that's why I think sometimes history is so important to teach kids because they can kind of, you know, meander and kind of go back and forth through certain things. And then you learn about it and you go, wow, that's pretty cool. So um, a seminal weird moment, but again, Something that if I'm taking up too much time talking about it, I apologize. Well, no, but I, but I just want to show just a little more video because this is pretty as well cool. As city residents, right, the the is, don't travel unless it's an absolute emergency. Uh, the outer drive is completely closed, and there are a few deserted cars there, and they have snow up to the hood, so uh, it's uh, pretty bad here. The snow finally was... stopped coming down just after 10 a.m. on January 27th more than 29 hours after it began. 50,000 cars and 800 buses were abandoned on the city streets. Oh. The only way to survey Chicago's plight was from the air. I flew over Chicago and it was twice as bad as I expected. I mean, I had get reports all night long from ward superintendents, but nothing was moving. Uh, it was a shock. Attempts to clear the roads were hindered by a catch-22 situation. No cars could be moved until plows got through. But no plows could get through all the cars. Imagine the problems in cleaning snow on a workday in a major urban area, but then complicate it by putting a, thousands of vehicles out there that folks simply just abandoned because they couldn't go any farther, even on the big uh, highways and thoroughfares. They would go in and uh, try to plow and find out that they had a Volkswagen underneath it. It was unbelievable. They actually did plow right over cars and take off bumpers trying to get them out with the, uh, with the heavy snow. I remember seeing people walking down the Dan Ryan because their cars were just stuck in a huge train of stopped cars. So there we go. It's just uh, pretty uh, remarkable. Now, I was not here. I, I, I was living in Detroit. At the I'm time. the only one of the three of us that was here. So oh, you these... were what, a couple years old when that happened, Peg, 1967? Yeah. I think you mentioned, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. One more weird thing. Yeah. Um, when I was teaching this class at the Art Institute and I was showing that video, this was about 15 years ago, I was kind of like making fun of the way that guy spoke. No cars can get through all the plows. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding you guys. A girl in like the second row goes, Professor DeMaio? That person who's making those that that weird gravelly voice, I go, yeah. She goes, that's my dad. Wow. Holy that smoke. Was, that's her dad. I went, I am so sorry. She goes, oh, no, 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 no problem. Because my dad will sometimes narrate us, and there she goes, going over to the bathroom. You know? Uh, so that, <laughs> That, that person who you heard um, has done a lot of Bud Light or those uh, but real men from Genius, those Bud Light commercials. Yeah. Um, but uh, the um, oh, I the remember company, that. Yeah. Yeah, the company that produced those videos, history for the History Channel, is from uh, uh, the North the Northbrook area, I think. So that's Tower Production. So they've used that guy for um, his voiceover for probably about half a dozen of these documentary and then you can actually you can actually just google um real men of genius wgn morning news because he did a bit for them but yeah well, he's got that voice that's very yeah. distinguished we again, we have somebody who who was who survived that storm right here who wants to give a first-hand account go ahead kathleen i that was i had just moved up from oklahoma it was my first year at Northwestern and my first Yankee snow. Oh. And I walked to class. I actually walked to the student union 
only to find that no one else had except <laughs> another guy from Oklahoma. Wow. They, they all knew how unusual and scary this was. And she thought, yeah. it's just another snow. I thought, boy, they could get a lot of snow in the north. Yeah, no, that... I think I think what makes that event so unique, Kathleen, is that A, it was unforecasted. Uh, B, it was really between Milwaukee and the south side of Chicago. Kankakee didn't get that much. Um, once you went east of like Chesterton, Indiana, they didn't get that much. Far northwest Illinois didn't get that much. It was really a lot of lake enhanced snow during that time. Um, and on top of that, two days prior to that event, and again, the anniversary is coming up this week. It was warm. It was in the mid-60s. Yeah. Um, there was no snow on the ground. So it really, I think, it, 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 it produced an air of uh, it's not going to happen. It can happen, not only for the people, for the city, but more so importantly, um, for the forecasters. But here's the really interesting thing. Three months later, three months later, actually three months later, February, March, April, yeah, three months later, we had the horrible tornadoes of April 21st, 1967. That killed 58 people in Northern Illinois. So when people say, oh my God, the people at the National Weather Service of Chicago, they don't know how to forecast. But yet they put out incredibly accurate and timely tornado warnings for those tornadoes that came through just three months later. And tornadoes are a lot harder to forecast than the blizzard. So the whole thing about them not forecasting it accurately was they just didn't have the observations, they didn't have the technology, um, and I think as Peg alluded weather to, which is, yeah. I mean, yeah, no weather satellites that were actually used. We had weather satellites, but they weren't used for operational pur purposes. We were in the Cold War still. Um, but yeah. um, it, it was just, it, it was not something that you would think could happen because it never mm -hmm. happened before. And as I was mentioning, uh, as Peg said, it was really warm two days before. So everything leading up to that event didn't think, you weren't thinking snow. Um, and also, it was it happened during the early morning hours of a work day. Everybody went to work. Mm -hmm. They looked out the window, and everybody ran home. And that's when everybody got stuck. People weren't getting stuck going to work. People were getting stuck trying to get home. Uh, and because of that, a lot of people didn't get home. I mean, it was we didn't have the the public transportation uh, infrastructure that we have now. A lot of people were driving. And that was also the beginning of white flight. So a lot of people were, were already beginning to leave the suburbs or leave the city and drive out to the suburbs, and they just couldn't get home. And that turned out to be the most catastrophic natural disaster um, since the Great Chicago Fire. 150 people uh, died in that particular event, mainly wow. because it had a shovel, heavy, wet snow. Yeah. yeah, heavy, wet snow does not – just to today. Yeah. yeah, heart attacks. Yeah. Well, well. Speaking like, speaking of snow, you just sent this a little while ago, and this is what's going on in Chicago today. Um, yeah, and uh, that's there's quite a range of uh, snow events here. Yeah, well, so these snow reports basically go from Milwaukee down to about Kankakee. Um, this is a typical Alberta Clipper. You can see the way it kind of came in from the northwest to the southeast um, a month ago. If this would have come through, it would have been to the north of us. There was no snow on the ground, and we'd be talking about a sunny day close to 50 degrees. But because that system went a little bit further south, um, we got the snow. There's now snow on the ground. We're not going to get as warm. We'll probably get to 20 degrees today. Um, and yet there's going to be another one tomorrow, followed by an even colder air mass that's going to come through here on Wednesday and Thursday. So... Similar again, yeah, similar again to what occurred around here last year. It took until the end of January to really feel uh, like it's winter. So there's the prediction of the snow that came through here um, over the last 36 to 48 hours. And that second area pink uh, to the north of us, that's that second area of snow that's probably going to hit us during the day on Monday. So remember, we had a little bit of snow Saturday. It wasn't much. This thing that came through last night. Um, it looks like we got about four inches of snow. And if you want to measure it, I'd go out there now because this stuff will blow around and settle uh, very quickly. Uh, but in addition to that, I think what's more important, and Peg, you kind of, you know, tweaked my brain a little bit last week. Um, we're actually back in a moderate drought across northeast parts of Illinois. And this Whoa. only gave us about, yeah, this only gave us about a quarter inch of precipitation. Of so it was about a fifth. Yeah, it's so light and fluffy. 
very light and fluffy, and it's not going to help us out from a moisture standpoint because A, the ground's too cold. B, it'll probably um, evaporate before it begins to melt a little bit. But you can see when this first system came through, this was the one that came through Friday night into Saturday. So you can see the way snow comes through, it kind of goes up to the north of us. Uh, those blue lines represent uh, temperatures. So when the black lines are pushing against the blue, that's air that's beginning to cool down at the surface, and there's the snow. So this is a forecast model, and it really did a good job. I mean, you can see exactly where the snow was. However, over the last 24 hours, that snow band shifted just a little bit further north. So we ended up in more of the four inch band than the two to four inch band. So sometimes people say, why do you guys give ranges for snow? That's because we know that in some areas you're gonna get a pretty decent shot and in other areas you're gonna be on the edge. So this is the stuff that's coming through on Monday, but even this now looks like it's gonna take a little bit further track to the south. Um, and then we get pretty cold around here. So this is Monday night into Tuesday, and then everything that comes through here um, for the next probably, I'd say, into Tuesday. I think what you did was you clicked on the link. So this is updated. Yeah. So this is actually showing the snow that fell last night and then the snow that's going to come through tomorrow. So we'll probably end up with another two inches of snow around here during the day um, Monday, but more so Monday afternoon. It shouldn't. I don't think at this point, I have not looked at anything updated yet this morning, but um, I don't think it's going to interfere with the rush hour, but I could be wrong. Uh, you know, this is an interesting map. This one shows the uh, snow season snowfall right. accumulation since uh, the uh, 9.30, so September 30th. Um, and if you look at it, it's really remarkable. Uh, Chicago has very little snow, but even less snow in central Indiana and Illinois. Oh, yeah. And actually less snow if you go up into um, uh, into Wisconsin. I was actually just reading a report because I was up in Milwaukee yesterday and I was reading a report off of one of the local newspaper websites. Um, and the people who plow snow are really, really hurt pretty bad right now. Um, now, granted, this snow was probably helping them out somewhat. But the stuff that's up to the north, um, they, they've been not only not plowing snow, but there's there's not enough snow for any snowmobiles. So that part of the industry, and I've been saying this for the last five years, if you're trying to make money running snow snowmobiles in southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois, uh, the last five winters, good luck. But by the way, Mike, real quickly, I'm going to show you this. If you notice, see the radar right there? Oops, uh, I think it just updated. No, uh, hold on. <laughs> oh, wait, do I need to get uh, your, your no, image? No, 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 no that's, that's fine. I'm just showing you off my phone. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Well, I, let wait, me... Wait. We can't Let, see your phone right now. Hang yeah, on. Hold, hold on. Let me, uh, here we go. And here we go. All right. Show, what do you, and let me get rid of the uh, title here so that you can, what are we looking at? Oh, wow. That's, we got we got some lake effect coming in here, huh? A lot of lake effect. Not over us. It's basically to the east of us. But if you go about maybe 10 miles east of downtown Chicago um, into northern Illinois, uh, not northern Illinois, northwest Indiana, uh, they're getting an additional four to six inches of snow. So there's a really narrow band of lake effect snow coming down the west side of the lake. And again, part of the reason is because there's no ice on the lake. Uh, mm -hmm. This is one of those winters, again, where we're going all the way into mm -hmm. literally um, the end. Actually, I got a better picture. This is from the College of DePage site. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The plume, yeah. as it were. Yeah, De Deb Moulton's. Deb Moulton's watching. Deb, how much snow you got out there right now? Um, and she's in Chesterton or nearby. Um, she said Chesterton, yeah. By, by the it, way, Rick, we are getting just... West, this, West all, of Chesterton. West of Chesterton. Yeah. We're getting all these remarkable stories from people about surviving the blizzard uh, of 65. Oh, cool. uh, yeah. And uh, uh, this, is th this is a great one. Uh, Diana says... I was 22 and stranded in Old Town in the campaign offices of an aldermanic candidate. I called a friend who lived nearby, but still too far for me to walk to, and she called a friend who was only two blocks away and arranged for me to spend the night there. It took me half an hour to go the two blocks, uh, and as I entered their gangway, which had accumulated drifts, I sank to my shoulders. 
I fought yeah. my way back to their back door, which was only waist high, but found myself eyeball to eyeball with a dog that was probably a German shepherd, but in my near frozen delirium thought was a wolf. We stared at each other for a while, and he finally went back in the slightly parted doorway. After a few minutes, I continued toward the coach house where I would spend the night with strangers who gave me some whiskey and blankets to warm me up. So that's a great story. Yeah. And Deb, yeah, Deb, who's 15 minutes west of Chesterton, says they've got about six inches right now. Yeah, yeah. It, this is definitely just a Lake County um, event. But from what I can see, when you start to see yellow showing up on the on the radar, uh, that's two inches an hour easily. And again, yeah. even though there's a lot of quote pancake ice, which is how we discarded this, started this discussion 35 minutes ago, um, about 90% of Lake Michigan, there's no ice. There is yeah. no ice. Now two things come out of this, right? The pancake ice has been pushed up against the shoreline, which is great. So the shore is pretty much shoreline, pretty much from central Wisconsin down into Chicago, the northern part of Indiana, southwest areas of Lower Michigan have a really nice pile, probably about four or five feet high, of uh, shoreline pancake ice. So it looks like the beaches are going to be protected. So no problem there. Um, the lakes themselves are down almost 20 inches from where they were last year, almost 30 inches from wow. two years before. And even though, even though uh, the lakes are open, if you can get a lot of clouds and a lot of snow off the lakes, that'll actually drop the lake um, easily one or two inches. So all that mm -hmm. snow's got to come, some, got to come from somewhere. So this is good. I mean, some people go, "Oh my God, it's terrible that there's no ice." But you know, Mother Nature, science has a way of evening things out. And if you can get cold enough air down the lakes this time of the year, it makes people who want snow happy, and it gets the levels of the lake down, and it also produces some decent ice along the shoreline. So in the end. Um, I know we're heading into the coldest week of the year, but the good news is by the time we get to the end of the week on the 29th, um, as Peg likes to point out, um, sunset is going to be <laughs> after five o'clock and on the 29th of uh, January, we begin to actually get, uh, the afternoon average temperature up one degree. So we go from 31 to 32. Wow. So, and the, sol uh, the, the solar rays get more intense. Yeah. Yeah, the solar rays get more intense, and uh, there's just a little there's a little bit more backscattering be just because the the angle is yeah. um, greater. So, so, bottom line, we're at the bottom of winter right now. But if this is what the first yeah, half my, of winter, my my birthday is like the oh. bottom end of winter. So uh, <laughs> that's what I always yeah. get to celebrate the worst day of that's the year. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 and, and and you're right. That's that's pretty much that's pretty much where we are right now. So I know we still didn't get a chance to talk about all the climate stuff from two weeks ago. So hopefully we'll do that. I'm, um, I'm holding on to those graphics. Yeah, let's let's see. Let's start that next week, assuming that no yeah, weather happens at all during the week. Uh, that none, and the none, volcano. And Tundra, nothing's going to yeah. happen. Um, so uh, yeah. yeah, what is our forecast here? All right. So snow is over here. Obviously, another four or six inches in parts of Lake County, Indiana, and that's it. Just Lake County. Um, whereas last week it was more Porter County. Um, 2025 for high today, um, another maybe one to three inches of snow tomorrow, though I have not looked at the details, but it definitely looks like much colder weather for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with highs only in the teens. And the pattern is becoming a little bit more favorable for us for cold and bigger snow. So the, the, the deep trough, instead of it being like over – Central Canada has kind of pushed a little bit further west, and that will allow these systems to dig a little bit and get a little bit more Gulf of Mexico moisture. Uh, but it is pretty interesting. Um, I was just looking at some climate analysis of the period from, I believe it was the end of October through the middle of January, and it's called the Pacific North American Oscillation, which is an index of how strong the wind is from Eastern Siberia across the Northern Pacific into Western Canada. And remember I kept talking about how strong the jet was and that you were getting phenomenal rains in parts of British Columbia, but you were getting just really dry downslope warming. Um, that index was the lowest it's been in over 70 years. So a lot of times you can go back and look at the index and when it's highly negative, that means that the wind is blowing really strong in that area, and that usually leads to 
warming east of the Rocky Mountains and dry weather for the upper Midwest. So the reason why it's important to go back and look at those, those large scale indexes is that if we can learn how to forecast those based on global patterns, then you can get a better idea of how the weather is going to be more regionally. So what that means is if you can start to be able to predict that there is going to be that sort of pattern over the upper Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains, and you're already in a drought, knowing that there's an increased chance of wildfires, then that allows you to do better adaptation and mitigation efforts in the short term. So what drives people crazy about climate change is they go, well, what do you want me to do? How do you, how do you want me to fix things? That's a really hard thing for people to wrap their heads around. So if we can do a better job of understanding what literally the short-term regional forecast is for a season, that's like me going, this is what the weather is going to be tomorrow, as opposed to me telling everybody every day, here's a seven-day forecast, you have to remember the whole thing. People don't want to hear that. They want to know what's going to happen tomorrow and do I need to scrape snow off my car, all right? So the bottom line is, these, these large-scale indexes that give us a, an understanding of how regional weather is going to occur over the next three to four months can be really helpful, especially if we know going into it that you have severe drought. And that could have maybe helped us understand more so what could have happened in the areas of Colorado, you know, back in December. Mm -hmm. um, and also some of the phenomenal flooding uh, that occurred in Washington State and remember in British Columbia. So yeah. and and, I, I, and in Kentucky and Tennessee uh, earlier last year, um, not the same thing. Yeah, I don't, no, I don't. No, I don't think that's related to the Pacific North Atlantic Oscillation. Oh, okay. Uh, that's, that's okay, though. That's okay. But um, it it does give us a better understanding going into the seasons where we need to quote shore up our defenses, mm. and and that's and that's where we're trying to get to, um, and. Uh, and those are the things that, you know, when you go to a, a conference like the AMS conference, <clears throat> you literally go from room to room to room over the period of three or four days, and you hear these things as opposed to virtually. Virtual conferences, they, they're they a waste of time. I, I have to say <laughs> they really are. I mean, who's going to go on their computer going, where am I going to go next? But I have to run a virtual conference um, on Tuesday, and wish me luck with that. Uh, okay. And Good I'll luck. just advise everybody, don't waste your time. Uh, don't visit Rick at all because it's not going to be worth it. I'll be mad. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions? No, all right. Goodbye. So what is that forecast? Uh, cold Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, a little bit of a warm up Thursday. And then next weekend, uh, we could be seeing some significant snow close to us. Um, don't know exactly where, but it still looks like it's going to be mainly mid Atlantic in the Southeast. So that's where it looks like the worst is going to be. Okay. All right. It was great uh, reminiscing about the uh, the blizzard. I can't believe how many people are writing about their experiences. Uh, it's great. Uh, so, folks, go if you if you've watched it on uh, YouTube or Facebook, go and check the comments. Um, I wish we could combine all of those, but we'll talk. That's up to me and Peggy. Anyway, Rick, great seeing you. We'll uh, we'll talk again next week. Sounds good. Take care, guys. Thank all you. right. You too. Um, wow. Okay. So uh, it. Uh, that was a terrific show, um, and I want to remind folks, uh, of course, that uh, they can still. Oh, I need to check to see how many people have subscribed, subscribed. and how much money I'm yeah. on the hook I'll for. Donate to. Uh, and if and holy I would also smoke, say if, if have, anybody else out there wants to match the donation, contact Mike. That's true. If you want to match, because it's now we've got. We had what? What did we have? We had. It we was had seventy-eight. Up, it's now up to eighty-nine, four eighty-nine subscribers. So we have gotten just under. We've gotten about ninety. So we're at four hundred forty-five dollars. I think, I think ninety-two. So four hundred forty-five dollars that are for going. Yeah, um, so you're welcome to subscribe, and if you do subscribe, I hope you actually watch or listen. To the show at some point too I, as i tell people you don't even have to watch the show just subscribe so we can donate that money and, and, and i'll Hill. add to that subscribe to the channel but please go to itunes or your favorite podcast mm -hmm. pull up the mike novak show and please 
subscribe there. Again, Man. you don't have to listen to it. Just subscribe we and just give me five stars. Subscribe. Don't have to listen to it. Just give me five stars. How does that work? Is that okay? Perfect. All yep. right. Let's get out of here. I want to thank everybody who's on the show today. Boy, it was fun. Doug Tallamy. Yep. The Nature of Oaks. Doug Tallamy. I appreciate him being on the show. Of course, Carrie Lee from the Natural Land Institute. Uh, Deborah Behrens from the Prairie Enthusiasts. Meteorologist Rick DeMaio. Kathleen, who gave us her snowstorm experience from back in, in the day. Of course, she was going to Northwestern, which was right on the lake, so they got hammered. I um, want to thank Legata the cat who disappeared long ago. Basil the dog who did not bark. Uh, you so didn't that, hear him. He was barking. You oh, didn't hear him. well, I didn't hear him. Well, until next time, go green or go home. Uh, Stadler? Uh, what? Is that it? Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much. <laughs>